-hmm. you know, stories versus statistics. One, mm -hmm. you know, we remember them better. They motivate us. They inspire us. They live in the slums. They're undernourished. They have very little access to education, help them with character development, computer science, English communication. There are only two kinds of people who do not experience painful emotions, such as sadness or anxiety or sorrow or anger or frustration. Two kinds of people, psychopaths and dead people. Anti-fragility, Resilience 2.0, takes this further. You put pressure, stress on something, it doesn't just go back to where it was before, it actually grows bigger, stronger, better, healthier. Meditation, such as finding a sense of meaning and purpose, such as prayer, such as um, regular physical exercise, doesn't just make us physically tougher, it actually makes us psychologically tougher. PTSD is breaking down, PTG is growing stronger, it's being anti-fragile. Uh -huh. there you and go. when we showed that grades went up, suddenly we had schools lining up outside our door. <laughs> of course, yeah. Um, I can come into your organization, increase well-being by, you know, 5%. Revenues, profits are going to go up. Now that becomes interesting. The thing is, you won't reach, you won't serve as many people, you won't do as many good things, you won't last as long as a, as a contributor to society. And that people who are curious, who ask questions, who are lifelong learners, actually end up living longer. Hey friends, welcome to Headspace. You are about to be blown away by my interview with Tal Bel Shahar. He is a PhD from Harvard. He actually created a course in Harvard that was at the time the most popular course in Harvard. He teaches about happiness and not of the fluff. He teaches about the science, the power, the transformational quality of happiness in people's lives. And he's written about it extensively, several uh, best-selling books, including two children's books. And he also is the founder of the Happiness Studies Academy. It's the first in the world graduate program on happiness studies. Uh, so he's pioneering new things in education, which is very, very exciting. You're going to love the insights he has. And the tools are very practical, easy to implement, clear, powerful, transformational, life-changing tools that he will share about. Uh, so we talk about a whole wide range of things. One of them is the Ascend Academy, which is sort of a plug that I introduced very uh, smoothly into this conversation, which is um, an after-school academy in Maputo, Mozambique, that we sort of sponsor and run. Uh, and it's a program for kids who are underprivileged in one of the poorest countries in the world, and they get mentorship, uh, role models, computer science, English classes, uh, it's, it's an amazing environment to change, redirect, reframe the worldview of these kids who I think are destined for greatness and a very different trajectory in life just because of the academy. We're uh, raising funds to, to fund this ongoing and would love to see you as a partner, as a donor. So please go to www.ascend, as in going up, dot academy. Uh, check it out. Check out the stories. Give as you, uh, if you can. We're looking for especially individuals who, who are willing to commit year after year. And we have a special relationship with them. And we can give them special insights, information, feedback, that kind of thing. So having said that, please enjoy my conversation with Tal Ben Shahar. Uh, you're going to be blown away. Subscribe forward to some friends. Uh, I love, we love having you as part of Headspace, and uh, we want to spread the word and spread the goodness. Thank you again, and please enjoy the interview. Tal, welcome to the show. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I'm a huge fan of yours, as I've told you offline. Um, but the first question I ask, I want to ask you, is how do you, how do you get into happiness, positive psychology? What's the backstory there? Yeah, um, you know the backstory, and I think it's 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 quite a common one for people uh, involved in this field. Is that I I got into happiness because of my own unhappiness. Okay. Uh, you know, I was um, an undergraduate at Harvard doing computer science. And I found myself in my sophomore year doing well academically. I was also an athlete, played uh, on, on the squash team. I was doing well there. Uh, socially, things were fine. Uh, and yet, I was very unhappy. And, you know, when I look at my life from the outside, 
things looked great, you know, check the boxes. But from the inside, it didn't feel that way. And, and I remember waking up one very cold Boston morning, going to my academic advisor and telling her that I'm switching majors. And she said, what to? And I said, well, I'm leaving computer science, moving over to philosophy and psychology. Wow. And she said, why? And she said, why? And I said, because I have two questions. First question, why aren't I happy? Second question, how can I become happier? How old were you when you have had these questions? So, so I was, uh, I was 23 years old then. You know, that is I, a very uh, mature question to ask at age 23, don't you think? Well, you know, it, um, a lot of it depends on how, how, how bad it is, and it was pretty bad. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I had the yeah, same question around the same age, and I agree with you. I totally agree. Like, it really depends how bad it is, right? Yeah, because, you know, it, it can be just a matter of time, and you, you may get to these questions when you're, you know, 50 and 60, and some people do. Um, but if, if things are not going well, and if it hurts, yeah. then that's, uh, that really expedites the process. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah, that's great. And what, a, what, a, what an amazing beginning, right, to have a pain point and have enough passion and determination to switch majors. I mean, that's, that's not insignificant. That's pretty, yeah, pretty well, focused, you know, pretty intentional. Again, the question is how you look at it. Is it passion, determination, or desperation? Yeah. Desperation, a combination uh, of all those so things. It, and, and I think it was a combination, <laughs> exactly. It was, it was all three. <laughs> oh, that's great. So um, obviously happiness, it's uh, usually associated with obviously a feeling, right? And the thing that I love about positive psychology and happiness studies in general is that the, 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 the actual definition seems to be much more deep and multidimensional than just a feeling. Exactly. Uh, and, and, I, and, I've, and I've heard of and read about several definitions floating around. They're all overlapping, obviously. Nothing is exact and ultimate. But what's yours, I was wondering? Yeah, no, that, that, that's great. Because, you know, happiness is uh, so much more than just a feeling. Of course, feeling is, is part of it, but it's part of the equation. So the way um, I define happiness, I look at happiness as uh, comprising five elements. I call them the, the spire elements of happiness. Inspire is an acronym. The S stands for spiritual well-being. And uh, spiritual well-being, of course, many people find it in, uh, in religion. Um, and yet it can also come from uh, other places, as long as it's something that is meaningful to us. So a sense of meaning and purpose, that's when we experience the spiritual or when we're present to the moment. Um, when we're mindful, whatever it is that we're doing, whether it's eating or observing a, a plant or conversing, we're experiencing the, the spiritual. So sp spiritual well-being is about purpose and presence. Then there is physical well-being. You know, physical well-being is about uh, nutrition. It's about uh, sleep and recovery. It's about touch. It's about exercise. You know, just as, as an example, regular physical exercise has the same effect on our psychological well-being. Not yes, even talking here just about the physical. Same effect on our psychological well-being is our most powerful psychiatric medication. So obviously it's important for, uh, for, for happiness. So we have spiritual, physical. The I of Spire is intellectual well-being. That's about learning. It's about asking questions. Um, you know that there is um, research, came out recently, showing that people who are curious who ask questions, who are lifelong learners, actually end up living longer. So it's not just that curiosity is, is, you know, is good for business, for success, for, for, for happiness. It's actually, it actually makes us live longer. Curiosity kills the cat. It does the opposite to us humans. Um, so that's intellectual well-being, learning. Uh, then relational well-being, number one predictor of happiness is quality time we spend with people we care about and who care about us. Kindness, generosity, one of the most important uh, um, generators of, uh, of what I call life's ultimate currency, the currency of happiness. And then finally, emotional well-being. Of course, feelings matter. But here also, it's not just pleasurable emotions. It's also about learning to deal with painful emotions. Because we all experience sadness, anger, frustration, uh, uh, anxiety, envy. These are all natural human emotions. How do we deal with them? Do we reject them, in which case they only grow stronger? Or do right. we accept and embrace them, 
in yes. which case they do not overstay their welcome. So these are the five elements, spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional well-being. It's one, I think it's wonderful that um, I think it's wonderful that we are speaking in these terms of multidimensional, deeper mm. um, um, sort of nuances of happiness now, and it's now calm. It's becoming more mainstream than even twenty years ago, I think. Right, um, and yet I think the reality of 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 anxiety, of tension is still growing. It, it seems to be continually growing. Obviously, the, it sort of peaked during COVID, probably gained down, uh, came down just a little bit. But it seems to me that, you know, the one of my favorite quotes by uh, is by Henry uh, David Thoreau, where, he's, where he says, most men live lives of quiet desperation. And um, it, it, because it's such a jarring statement that seems to me, even from his time to today, to be this this baseline truth, right? Do you think this is actually accurate? Do you think that even in the 21st century, where objectively um, there's a, there's all of the bad things in if you take a span of 10,000 years, we have less bad things happening in our lives in, 20, in the 21st century. So it's actually objectively a, a more a safe place, a more you know affluent place, a more peaceful place, uh, and yet it seems to hold that that statement. Do you think that's true or this is just subjective and, and not true? Yeah. Um, so first of all, if it is subjective, it is true because yes, exactly. ultimately yeah. what, what, what matters is our subjective uh, evaluation of our life. Because objectively speaking, as you say, you know, people on average, and again, it's very dangerous when you talk about averages, right? But yeah. on average, yeah. people live longer, better, healthier, you know, they have more opportunities, more choices, mm -hmm. they're freer than ever, again, on average. Uh, needless to say, there, there are unfortunately many exceptions to this. Um, and yet, people are not happier. And yet, people are actually more stressed and anxious. And yet, people are actually experiencing more depression, and it starts at a younger age. Suicide rates are going up. So, so it's not looking good in terms of the, you know, the internal life. Externally, things look a lot better. Internally, not internally, so. not so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and and the question is why and what can we do about it? And and the answer, you know, I mean, there are many, there are many reasons, but one reason is that our focus historically, and when I say our, I mean the Western world, has been on the external. If you think about it quite remarkable what what we have done as a society i mean just look 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 outside the buildings the you know the the, the progress the uh you know we we've we've landed uh you know a man on the moon we have built skyscrapers we uh have been able to harvest nature's forces in in, in such remarkable ways um but as uh, you know as um robert oppenheimer who was you know the father of the uh the the uh, the atom bomb project said when he saw the impact of an atomic bomb he said we've become gods before we became humans wow so that's perfect we have we have really focused on harvesting this external power this ability yeah. science um but we have neglected the internal mm -hmm. um and um you know in, in some way and again this is a, a very crass generalization but but in, in in some way in the east the focus has been much more on the internal than the external you know whether you're thinking whether you think you know buddhism or confucianism or or, or taoism the, the the focus is much more on the internal less so on the external world yes um and what we need to do if we are to make progress if we are to become fully human is bring together you know the eastern and western approach to mm -hmm. synthesize integrate you know, science in the service of human development, human growth. And again, that's psychology and it's philosophy and it's a, it's a neuroscience um, and, and bringing all these abilities and, 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 and methods and techniques in order to create a, a, a human science. And that's what the science of happiness really is about, ultimately is about. And this is a relatively recent discipline, isn't it? I mean, it's been what twenty, thirty years, something like that. Can you talk about the the shift? Uh, this is one of the most valuable insights that I had from one of your talks. 
is that until a certain time, the focus, the main focus of psychology in general was to sort of hyper focus on 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 people that to, to bring people from the minus 10 to maybe a zero at best right and it seems to be an insufficient th- there seems to be insufficient research and, and and impact on tools to bring people from five to seven or five to ten um, yeah. is that is that yeah. accurate yeah exactly so so until 20 years ago essentially the ratio between research on depression anxiety anger, uh-huh. hatred, uh-huh. the research on these topics versus the research on love, joy, happiness um, has been 21 to 1. 21 so to every, 1. For every one article on happiness, there were you know 21 articles on depression. Now, this is not to belittle or to undermine the importance no, of, yeah. of, of research on, on depression. However, why has the scientific community by and large ignored or almost ignored Uh, happiness, joy, especially given the fact that we know that when we work on things such as strengths, joy, um, love, happiness, it doesn't just help us get from, as you point out, from, you know, the five to the seven, it also helps us better deal with With the the negative. It It actually makes us more resilient, better able to handle and I want to get I want to get there. I, I, I want to put a pin on that for just a second, but uh, because it's really a huge deal, and I want to talk about um, anti fragile. I want to talk about post traumatic growth. All of that stuff mm-hmm. uh, is huge. It's huge, huge, huge. Um, here's my question: Because why do you think? Why is it that we have a society that is flourishing, especially in the West? There's tons of money for research. Um, and all of that money, all of that attention, all of that sort of cultural focus is 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 poured into ne- the negative. Is it is it like is it like one, two, three key thinkers who shape that? Is it a cultural drift? And the reason I ask is because it just seems so counterintuitive um, for people who are strivers, right? I mean, the West is a striving society, mm. um, and. And if you're a striver, you'll recognize that you can be very good at something and get very successful um, and get opportunities. But then if you don't figure out this internal happiness element, it's going to start backfiring. It's going to limit your potential. It's going, you're going to hit a wall. Uh, and not only will you hit a wall, but you won't. the thing is you won't reach. You won't serve as many people. You won't do as many good things. You won't last as long. As a as a contributor to society and whatever it is that you do, uh, it seems so self evident, and yet uh, the focal point is all on the negative for for decades and decades and decades. Do you? Th- I, I'm just curious about why that happens. Yeah, you know, um, the first question that you asked me was about um, um, what got me into happiness, and 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 I said that it was the pain point. Yeah, you know, it was, uh, and the pain point is a lot more compelling than um, yeah, I'm That's doing okay, point. but I want to do a lot better. You right. know, if, if if you're doing okay, then okay, just you know, just just be quiet and let us deal with the real serious issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, and and again, that, that that makes sense to an extent, but where we're losing out, what we're missing out, mm-hmm. is that if we learn how to. Um, make the okay better, we're also in the long term preventing a lot of misery. You know, um, I was speaking uh, at a school uh, last week and, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the top schools in, in the US and, uh, you know, very smart, very conscientious uh, teachers who know a lot about math and who know a lot about history and know a lot about their, their subject and know very little about the science of happiness. And, and, and I said to them that it is critical, absolutely critical that they learn about the science of happiness. Why? Because, you know, maybe in a perfect world, each person would have a therapist, a psychologist. You know, obviously not realistic, not sustainable, not going to happen. The thing, though, is that psychologists very often deal with a situation when there, once there are already symptoms. In other words, it's a symptomatic approach to dealing with misery, with unhappiness. 
We need a systematic approach. And that systematic approach will not deal with the issue after it happens. It will prevent. It will prepare. So if you can teach students some of the basics of the science of well-being, you are helping them prevent the onset of depression seven years hence, or um, you know the onset of, of anxiety or, um, um, or um, toxic relationships 20 years down the line. You're preventing rather than dealing with, with the, the symptoms. And that's what we need to focus on. That makes on. a lot of sense. My- and I think as human beings, we're more reactive than proactive. Exactly. So collectively, we're more reactive than proactive. And then we focus on those things, right? Um, yeah, that makes that that actually that it does explain it for me. I think it makes a lot of sense, uh, and makes me happy that finally a proactive field, a proactive movement is on its way and it's growing. Um, do do you think there's going to be is is this? I'm a curious and sort of niche kind of guy, right? So I, when I find this and I found this a little bit, some time ago, I just pursue it. So. I follow people that are thinkers and leaders and teachers in this. So I might be a, a, just a one-off kind of person. Do you think objectively this is becoming more of a mainstream interest, a large-scale um, area of investment in, in yeah. the world? Uh, uh, the, the answer is, is an easy yes, and, but let me elaborate on this. You see, uh, what has been happening in this field is that it's becoming a, a science until... 30 years ago, you know, by and large, people who spoke about happiness or joy um, or or love mostly came from, you know, the self-help or new age. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There wasn't the rigor. And and therefore, because there was no science, because there was no rigor behind it, many people shunned the, 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 the movement or dismissed it. And sometimes rightfully so. Of course, but today the science is, is, you know, is getting behind it or underneath it, creating that foundation. Yeah, and and people are becoming much more interested. You know, it's a little bit like what happened around the whole field of mindfulness and meditation or yoga. You know, for a long time it was, um, you know, the the the, the eccentrics, uh, you know, the hippies who exactly, were, were doing. Yeah. Well, this is not serious. Uh, but then came along people like uh, John Kabat-Zinn and, and Richie Davidson and Sharon Salzberger and um, and uh, um, you know and, and and Daniel Goleman and and they went into the lab and they um, and they researched it. You know, they went into people's brain. You know, FM using fMRIs, using EEG, um, writing about it in in an accessible, yet very intelligent way. And now, you know, it's, 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 it's the thing. It is you know, the it, thing. It's, it's, it's legitimate to, to, to meditate. It's legitimate to bring a meditation class into your business or to introduce mindfulness practices in your school. It was the science that legitimized it. Yeah. And, and that's I think what's also happening the, within. I think all, what I've also noticed is that people that research it and now can find economic impact, measurable economic impact, on corporations, large organizations, countries, uh, that gets people's attentions, right? That, that's, a great point. that's a great point. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give just two, two um, short examples. You know, if I go to a company and I say to their manager, um, you know, I can come in and help your employees become happier, you know, maybe even 5% happier. You know, she'll probably say to me, that, that's Great. Why don't you That's come cute. for our... That's cute. <laughs> yes. I think cute more than great. Exactly. Why don't you come in for our you know, Christmas party? Exactly. And, and talk yeah. to our employees. Um, but if I come to the same CEO and I tell her, um, I can come into your organization, increase well-being by you know, 5%. And as a result of that, you'll have uh, not just happier employees, they'll be healthier, fewer day, days of, uh, of, of absence. Teamwork will improve. You'll get higher levels of creativity, innovation, productivity, and engagement will go up. And I'll show her all the data, all the research. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And basically, it's going to positively impact your bottom line. Revenues, profits are going to go up. Now, that becomes interesting that because becomes interesting. she's accountable to her board, you know, to her shareholders, other stakeholders. 
Yeah. Um, it becomes a lot more interesting. And you don't need to be a quote unquote enlightened leader and manager to bring in happiness into your organization. You have to be a pragmatic leader to mm. do it. You, you need to be practical. So, yeah, it went from being sort of cool, fringy, trendy, nice to have to economically viable, must have core to the bottom line measurable and that's a huge deal right it's exactly. a huge it's a deal. competitive advantage yeah absolutely you know I'll, I'll i'll give you another um another example so about 10 years ago i think just a little bit more we created a program for schools and um uh, increasing happiness levels of both teachers and students and we really tried to get it into schools and we weren't able to because as you know, all over the world, schools are, are, or students, teachers are extremely busy. And, you know, getting in an extra hour here and there is, 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 is very challenging because, the, you know, they have all these demands from the government or from the local authority or from parents and, you know, colleges. And we couldn't get it into a school. And basically what I did, I went to three close friends of mine who are school principals and I begged and I said, just do me a favor, please. Can we put this pro for free? You don't have to pay anything for it. Can we put this program in your school? And they said, Tal, sure, bring it on. So we brought it into my friend's school and we implemented it for two years. And after two years, we did research. Well, we did research throughout the two years, but after two years we found and we published a paper showing how it increased levels of well-being. We knew it would, that, that, that's what it was aimed at. And resilience levels went up, depression and anxiety went down and grades went up. Aha, uh -huh. there you and go. And when we showed that grades went up suddenly, and we published it, suddenly we had schools lining up outside our door. <laughs> of course, yeah. Now, it's the main motivator, right? Yeah. Now, to be honest, I don't care. I don't care yeah. if they come because they'll make more money or because they'll get better grades as or because their mom told them to. Yeah, you know, yeah. just come. It's good. For, it's good for everybody, right? The reason is secondary. It's a win -win. That's a that's a good question. Okay, so let's let's move on to the to anti fragility um, and uh, post traumatic growth. Uh, this really really fascinates me, and I'm really curious about what you have to say about this because the backstory. I think you know a little bit of my backstory that I have um, sort of a, a good amount of trauma, like you know, military coup refugee camps, civil war in Africa, the fall of the Soviet Union. Like I happen to, like I think civil unrest seems to follow me around. Uh, that's my wife. My wife's jokes about that, that Austin is in trouble just because we're here. Um, uh, but, but I've experienced so much of this at an early age. And um, I credit a lot of my abilities and success and strengths to those traumatic at the time uh, negative experiences like i can totally see the the why why they grow from that right and um it fascinates me and i'm gra actually grateful not that i wish for something like that for anybody to experience but i am grateful to have gained so much from it and then at the same time i look around and i see uh so many wonderful talented gifted people um not learn from pain, not learn from suffering, not grow from suffering, and shrink, get paralyzed, get super fragile. And it's such, to me, it breaks my heart because, well, it's, first of all, it makes them extremely happy, but also what a, what a loss for all of us to mm -hmm. not experience the full um, fulfilled human being that has sort of shrunk and is afraid, right? Just doesn't grow from those things and gets sort of paralyzed PTSD from it. So, can you unpack that? Because I'm, I'm, uh, I, yeah. I'm just interested to know what are the correlations. Okay, how do you, how do you face adversity or trauma of, of all kinds and have set yourself up for growth and anti fragility? Right? What's yeah. the what's the secret here? Good. So, um, first of all. Let's start with defining uh, a term, and that is the term anti-fragility. It was introduced by Nassim Taleb, who's yes. a professor at uh, NYU. And basically what it means, and uh, or the way I've come to look at it, is that it's essentially resilience 2.0. Right. Now, resilience 1.0 is the ability of a certain you know, body or material to go back to its original form after stress or pressure was put on it. So you Correct. squish a, you know, a piece of rubber, you let go. If it's resilient, it goes back to where it was before. You drop a ball, 
it bounces back up to where mm-hmm. it was before. That's why we talk about resilient individuals as bouncing back. And many of us are, right? Like if you have a, you, something affects us, we go down a bit and we come, come back to the original. Exactly. I think most people are somewhat resilient, wouldn't you say? Most people, most of the time, yes. are mm-hmm. resilient. Um, anti-fragility, resilience 2.0, takes this further. You put pressure, stress on something, it doesn't just go back to where it was before, it actually grows bigger, stronger, better, healthier. Or, you know, you take a ball, you drop it, it doesn't just bounce back up to where it was before, that's resilient, Mm -hmm. bounces back higher. Now, um, it turns out that there are anti-fragile processes, mechanisms within us and all around us. Take, for example, our muscles. We put pressure, stress on our muscles. As a result of it, we actually grow bigger, healthier, better, stronger. Stronger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We are an anti-fragile system physiologically, not just physiologically, also psychologically, it turns out. Now, Uh, what I do in my my classes, and again, whether I speak to those teachers or managers or to my psychology students, I always ask this question. I say to them, put your hand up if you know what PTSD is. Everyone puts their hand up. Everybody says, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Of course, yeah, I've read about it. I've studied it, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And then I say, okay, question number two, put your hand up if you know what PTG is. Very now, few people do. On, on average, 1%, whether I'm talking really? to psychologists, oh, wow. 1%, psychologists, teachers, um, and um, PTG stands for post-traumatic growth, as you pointed out. Now, the thing is that PTSD is breaking down as a result of trauma, PT. G, PTSD is breaking down, PTG is growing stronger, it's being anti-fragile. PTG is potentially twice as likely as post-traumatic stress disorder, potentially. Okay. If, first, we know about the existence of PTG, we know about the existence of, of, um, of uh, anti-fragility, we know about the possibility of growing following hardship. Why? Because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because if it's not in in my, you know, in my realm of possibilities, it's unlikely to happen. So if you just by knowing this is a potential, it changes the the formula. It it changes the equation significantly. Really? Wow. One. Two, there are certain conditions that you can put in place to significantly increase, not guarantee because nothing guarantees growth after trauma, but it significantly increases the likelihood if you put certain conditions in place, such as um, meditation, such as finding a sense of meaning and purpose, such as prayer, such as um, regular physical exercise, doesn't Uh just make us physically tougher, it actually makes us psychologically tougher, such as um, a supportive environment, uh, relationships, such as um, experience accepting our emotions, such as expressing gratitude. In other words, you look at the spire elements, spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional. They're all potential triggers for growth, for anti-fragility, for yeah. growth after mm-hmm. hardship. So basically, it make- pays off It pays off to invest in practices that raise your, your spire uh, quo- quotient, for, for, for lack of a better word, because anything that comes your way that is unexpected, traumatic, huge, you you will just survive it. Not only survive it, but you'll grow from it, correct? There's a higher probability. Exactly right. You're more likely to. You know, um, many of my, my, my students, especially the young ones, would, um, like 18-year-olds, would come to me and say, after you know the first month of class, they would say, Tal, you know, I love positive psychology or I love the science of happiness. Uh, in fact, I'm thinking of majoring in psychology and focusing on positive psych, whatever. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then they, they, they say to me, you know, in their very, you know, young and earnest uh, way, they say, but Tal, I'm really concerned. And, and I've heard this a number of times and I, and I ask, why are you concerned? And I say, because what if I become so good at positive psychology, but if I become <laughs> so good at the science of happiness, then I will no longer experience those hardships and difficulties that you talk about are so important for growth. <laughs> and my uh, response to that is always the same. I always say to them, don't worry. 
Don't worry, they will come. <laughs> Life will take care of you. Life always takes care of us. You'll be fine. So yeah. the, question, the question is not whether or not we'll experience those hardships, because we will. The question mm -hmm. is, what do we do with them? Yeah, you know, yeah. you, you know the sentence, Christian, that people say, oh, things happen for the best. Yes. And, um, you know, I'm not sure I buy that. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think things happen for the best, but I do know that we can make the best of things that happen. Yeah, that's a major distinction. Absolutely. And, that... and, 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 the, and, and to make the best of things that happen, we need to, first of all, know about the possibility of anti-fragility, of post-traumatic growth. And we need to know what conditions we can put in place. That's right. To increase yeah. the light. So I think I remember reading somewhere that you, didn't you have the most popular course in the history of Harvard or something like that? Um, was that related to happiness? Am I, am I mis misremembering what I read? Yes. Yeah, so um, I had the most popular course at Harvard at that time. It's not, time. not, not in history. But yes, okay. Got it. In, so in, at the time. In positive psychology. In positive. Now. Well, that's it. Still, is significant, right? So, is this due to this universal appeal, right? Like, I think I think I've I've heard um, was it Sonia Lubomirsky or something or somebody like that who has done tremendous work in the field that you can go across nations. So it's not just an American thing, the pursuit of mm -hmm. happiness. You can go you go to any nation anywhere. And what you, if you ask a parent, what do you want for your child? One of the things that you will say as a parent is, I just want him to be happy. So mm -hmm. is that, is that what it is? Do you find that humanity is sort of drawn to that? And if so, why? Yes. So humanity is drawn to it because of our universal nature. Mm -hmm. um, we want uh, to pursue happiness and you can call it, uh, um, we want to uh, reduce uh, pain or suffering. You know, if you, if you use a, a, a Buddhist, uh, perspective. Um, we want pleasure, uh, get rid of pain. We're looking for it on an organic, primal, uh, instinctual level. Right. And um, once a class was offered on, on this topic, and again, I wasn't the, the, the first one to, to teach a class in positive psychology, but once the class was taught, in other words, we're talking about the science of happiness, of evidence-based tools and techniques that can help us increase happiness, reduce suffering, then yeah, of course, students are going to be interested in it. You know, I, just about every university where, uh, where this class is taught, it's the biggest or one of the biggest classes. You know, now we have it at Yale where, uh, you know, Laurie Santos teaches it. We have it in, uh, we, it, you know, it's being taught at uh, Stanford and thousands of, uni at Tsinghua University in, in Beijing. And thousands of universities around the world are, um, are, are, are teaching this topic and, and students are flocking into, you know, the, the, these, these classes because it can actually help them improve the quality of their life. And because of the relationship between success and happiness, it can also help them become more successful, not just happier. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I, want, I find it to be endlessly fascinating and powerful to know, look, if you, if you work on this, if you work on the disciplines of a happy life, you will most likely make more money, live longer, display your talent, reach your, have deeper relationships, have a better marriage, be healthier that whole time. Like these are, these are researched facts. And yet we spend, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars on an education, on a profession. Um, and we spend very, we, we might spend a course on happiness, and this is just in the last maybe 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like it's remarkable how much evidence there is to support that this is literally a superpower, right? And yet you invest very little uh, in learning how to. Uh, why do you think that is? Is it just because this is just a, a new... Uh, a new new movement uh, people just didn't know about it couldn't measure it didn't have the tools for it is that what it is yeah i i, I think that I mean, there are a few reasons one reason is that people yes are still skeptical about right. it because they have many of them have read encountered you know participated in workshops you name it around you know self-help or new age and these workshops these books very often over promise and under deliver under deliver yeah so people have become you know, cynical, skeptical, and again, to an extent, rightfully, rightfully so. 
and so oftentimes, we'll and oftentimes, it's not that they overpromise; is that people underinvest. <laughs> it's not enough to read a book, right? To yeah. to become, you have to do the work. So, okay, go on. Yeah, exactly. That's part of it. But you know, but where where they overpromise is be is where they do not claim and say only if you put in the work, right? Then yeah. then you will. Um, no, just mm-hmm. read the book. Just understand. Just get the five steps to happiness, and then you'll be then you'll be as happy as yeah. as I am. Yeah, forever and ever was, yeah. it doesn't work that way you know just yeah. like you don't become a, a a good or even a better pianist or a good or a better tennis player by just reading a book about it or attending a lecture on it in the same way for happy happiness is a skill and you need to work at it you need to practice just like you would on a piano or or, or hitting a tennis ball over and over again Thank you. That's very validating. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, one of my favorite quotes uh, of all time is Viktor Frankl's uh, about happiness, because he basically, of course, very famously wrote uh, this remarkable, life-changing book in my book, like probably in my f- top three, five books of, of all time, uh, M- M- Man's Search for Meaning, after enduring the, like, the hell of Auschwitz, things like that. And he wrote that happiness cannot be pursued it must ensue Mm. and it's just it's one of the most profound insights on happiness that i've ever found anywhere and i think you speak on it as well um in a very uh, in, in a very clear i think and helpful way where you sort of point out that in some ways the people that pursue happiness for the sake of happiness actually won't be happy so can you unpack that for us because i think it's very valuable Yeah, I, I, I'd love to because this is one of the real barriers yes. that exist um, and prevent many people, including experts in the field, from wow. fulfilling their potential for, yeah. for happiness. So, you know, on the one hand, we've just been talking about how amazing happiness is. You know, you'll be, hap- uh, you, you'll be happier and therefore you'll be more successful. You'll live longer. You'll have better relationships. Um, you'll be more creative, uh, you know, you name it, every parameter, every variable you look at, you know, happiness is, 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 is a boost. Um, so you want to be happier. And yet there is research by Iris Moss and others showing that if you really value happiness and the pursuit of happiness is, is, is a central pursuit for you. And if you wake up in the morning and say, I want to be happier happiness is important for me, you will actually become less happy. So, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Yes, we do. Because (laughs) on the one one hand, you're told and you know that happiness is very important. But on the other hand, if you really value it as important, if you really pursue it, because it is important, you'll become less happy. So what do we do about this, um, this issue, this, you know, sort of a paradox? Um, The answer to it, is that you shouldn't pursue happiness directly. You need to pursue it indirectly. Indirectly. And let me explain this through an analogy. So let's say you go outside and, you know, it's a bright, sunny day and you look up at the sun. What happens? You burn yourself. You know, you, you, you tear up. It hurts. Mm. So looking at the sun directly hurts. But what if you take that same sunlight, that ray of light, and you bring, you know, a prism, and you break it, and you look on the other side of the prism where you have the colors of the rainbow. Instead of looking at the sun directly, you look at it indirectly. Oh, now you can enjoy it. Now you can savor it. Now you derive benefit from it. And it's the same with happiness. Interesting, yeah. Pursue it directly, it will hurt you. You'll actually become less happy. And that's the brilliance, and again, the research wasn't out yet when, when, when Viktor Frankl wrote about. That's the brilliance of Viktor Frankl. Because if I wake up in the morning and say, I want to be happy, I'll be less happy. But if I wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to do more things that are meaningful to me. Yes. Or I'm going to exercise um, more regularly. Or uh, I'm going to do the gratitude, ex- uh, gratitude uh, journal. Or uh, I'm going to spend more time with my loved ones. You know, without you know the in, w- without technology getting in the way, just 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 us, or mm. uh, or um, I'm going to learn new things. These are all ways to increase happiness, to pursue happiness indirectly, because the colors of the rainbow, metaphorically speaking, there are the spire elements. That's beautiful. Spiritual, physical, intellectual, relational, and emotional. That's beautiful. And happiness ensues. 
in the words of um, exactly right. of Victor Frankel. Yeah, that's 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 wonderful. So um, I have a couple of, a couple of Mary sort of side notes and questions that are more practical. Um, the first one is this: if someone's out there and you are you have this sort of mountain on your shoulders, right? You're in the pit of despair. You're listening to this podcast or watching it on YouTube. And you have sort of this dead end of, you know, I lost my job or I got through a divorce. I lost a loved one. The layers, right? When it pours, it rains type stuff. Mm. You're in the pit of despair. When you hear someone talking about happiness, potential, downstream success, it almost feels conject. Uh, it just almost feels like fluff, right? To someone like that, because you're you're in such, you're in such a you're in a minus five. You're not even at a zero. What would you say to someone like that? As okay, here's the first step. Here's the second step. Here's the third step. One step at a time, mm-hmm. to go to zero and then beyond the zero, right? Uh, what are some of the things that maybe would work for someone who is not like just tell me what to do. I'm ready to flourish, yeah. but I'm, I can barely believe that I can flourish. Right. Yeah. What, what would you say to someone like that? So the first thing that I would say is that you're not alone. Meaning, um, there are only two kinds of people who do not experience painful emotions, such as sadness or anxiety or sorrow or anger or frustration, two kinds of people, psychopaths, and dead people. <laughs> yes. So if you do experience these emotions, it's actually a good sign. You're not a psychopath. You're, you're alive. Dead. You're alive. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the first, you're not alone. We all experience, we all go through these hardships. And the key here is to give yourself the permission to be human, mm. to give yourself the permission to experience the full extent. Um, of human emotions because the paradox is that when you reject these emotions they will just grow stronger they will intensify and paradoxically when you accept embrace these emotions they will not overstay their welcome they will leave just as they came yeah then it's to realize that painful emotions and pleasurable pleasurable emotions are two sides of the same system the same coin Mm -hmm. you know uh, khalil gibran in his uh, beautiful book the prophet says your joy is your sorrow unmasked. Your joy ah, is your sorrow unmasked. That is beautiful. And he says that the more sorrow we experience, the more we o- literally open ourselves up to the experience of, uh, of joy. And again, remember the paradox, because when you reject, if you say to yourself, I'm going to be strong, I'm going to get over it, I'm not going to experience these painful emotions, they're not going to go away. They're going to grow stronger. Whereas when you accept and embrace them, you allow them to flow through you. That's when you're more likely to overcome them. That's when you live naturally. That's when you're fully, fully human. And then, of course, as a second step, again, first step, acceptance. As a second step, okay, so what can I do that may help me? May not, but may help me feel better. Is it exercising? Is it uh, seeing friends? Um, And I experiment with it and I try it and it doesn't work and I go back to crying. Mm-hmm. Or I write about it, or I talk about it. Yeah, and you just it's feel first, your way forward, right? It's just one step at a time. Kirsten Neff, um, who writes about self-compassion, beautifully writes about it, um, says that the only way out is through. The mm, only way out is through. Yeah, that's right. That's wonderful. Okay, so question. Um, offline, we're talking about our interest in, in at-risk children. Um, how How this cycle how the tools of positive psychology happiness studies how they can actually powerfully transform um the the very trajectory of a young child who is just didn't have the opportunities right um i was telling you about the sand academy in maputo that we have and one of my passions is to help children early on who it just seems that the world has conspired to not offer them opportunities right they they live in the slums, they're undernourished, they have very little access to education. We're trying to rectify that. We, But we also help them with character development, computer science, English, communication, 
to give him some tools. And I'm fascinated by your research and by what you found in, in some of the research that you quote in just how effective some of those interventions can be uh, at, at scale, right? And to me, that is just powerful. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, when, when, when you're talking about um, at-risk population, the most important thing that you can do for them is uh, A, introduce some interventions, which are not excessively taxing, but things that they can relatively easily implement. And second, provide them with role models. Um, let me begin actually with the second, and then I'll get to the first. So why role models? Um, uh, Richard Snyder, considered one of the founders of the field of, uh, of positive psychology, uh, did a lot of research throughout his life on hope. And the way he defined hope is as comprising two elements, willpower and way power. Willpower okay. and way power. Willpower is about saying, yes, I can, I'm capable. It's about having the confidence that, that you know, you can uh, overcome um, mountains, that you can, uh, you know, get out of your uh, predicament. Um, that's willpower, but that's not enough, he says. We also need way power. Way power is, and this is how I'm going to do it. Uh -huh. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to do it this way. And if this doesn't work, this is the way that I'm going to take. In right. other words, have alternatives. Um, so having willpower, yes, I can, and way power, and this is how I'm going to do it, is critical. Now, we get that when we, when we look at role models. Because when I read about uh -huh. um, you know, Nelson Mandela's long walk to freedom, yeah. or about Gandhi's uh, experiments with truth. Or Viktor Frankl's, or, right? Or work. Viktor Frankl's, you know, yeah. um, you know, search for meaning. What I'm encountering are role models who, yes, had willpower and way power. So I'm learning from them and it's much more powerful than learning from, these are the five steps to happiness that you should follow and, and, and then you'll lead a full and fulfilling life. Why is yes, that? Is, is that because of the, of the human connection to the person as, as almost like an avatar for who you can be, right? Is that, is that what it is versus it's, a it's, purely intellectual concept of the five easy steps? Yes, it's, well, it's mainly because of, our, of the human connection, our natural connection to stories. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, stories versus statistics. One, mm -hmm. you know, we remember them better. They motivate us. They inspire us. And when we learn, you know, human stories, people we can actually connect to, learn from, you know, then, then, then you have impact. The second thing is to, to understand that to bring about change, first of all, it's no rocket science. Second, you don't need to bring about radical change, or, or rather you don't need to bring about uh, radical action in order to, to enjoy radical change. Small changes consistently applied yield um, mm -hmm. major difference. Interesting. All changes consistently applied. applied and yeah. what are small changes? You know, for example, you know, introduce physical exercise. Uh, do your gratitude journal. You know, once once a day for two minutes. Mm -hmm. Take um, you know, take thirty seconds for deep breathing three times during the day. Um, you know, spend an extra hour with you know friends and 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 family. Ask the question: What is meaningful? What is purposeful to me? Mm -hmm. Those small changes. Those small interventions can quite literally transform, change the form of a life. Of a life, yeah. And even in groups, that that works, correct? Because I was thinking, I actually sent uh, one of your talks to the Ascend Academy in Maputo, and I said, guys, I feel like we have elements of this. For example, we have mentors with these kids that they otherwise wouldn't have. And that's sort of the, the physical presence of adults who care model. about them, role model. Um, but man, I, I feel like we can introduce very small, very easy to implement uh, elements in on a daily basis in this and it will change the whole mood the whole i mean the whole framework of, of these kids yeah. view viewpoints right do you find that to be true in some of the th things that you've seen that where it was implemented yeah. with that risk uh, youth yeah Ab absolutely you know um i i, I coined a, a a term that comes from you know i'm, I'm immersed in the world of startups and, and you yeah, know of course, st yeah. startups talk about uh, mvps 
Yeah. Uh, minimum yeah. viable. Me too. I'm also involved in that same in that same minimum viable well. product. MVP, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the minimum that you can do to you know get out a beta version and you know yeah. and see yeah. what happens. Well, I've I've coined a term which I called MVIs. I love acronyms, as you as okay. you may have gathered. MVI is minimum viable intervention. Oh, nice. Minimum I viable like intervention. That. MVI. Okay. Um, and uh, what these are, are brief, you know, 30 seconds, one minute interventions that when consistently applied, yes. make a big difference. So, you know, for example, right here on my side, I have a, a little trampoline. Uh -huh. And um, and here, let, let me show you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Show me. Can, can you see it? Uh, yeah, I can see. Uh-huh. No. No, not yet. Oh, where, where is it? Oops. Sorry. There it yeah. is. Yeah, I see it. Uh -huh. Okay. The trampoline. Yes. Sorry, didn't, didn't plan that well. Um, <laughs> and uh, and um, so every few, um, um, every, you know, 90 minutes, two hours or so, just before we talked, actually, I get on it and I jump on the uh -huh. spot uh -huh. for 30 seconds. It doesn't have to be that long. I have one of those in the garage and I don't use it. Now I'm pulling it out. That's it. Because it's not next to you. It's not next to me. See, that's why. Yeah. Next to me. It's next. To, yeah. It's right here. You know, yeah. after we, we we finish, me, I'm gonna get on this and and jump, or okay. I do. You know, my burpees, or you know, jumping up and down, or wh wh whatever it is. Yes. But that can make a, uh, it can make a very big difference. These small interventions, if consistently applied. Okay, I'm bringing it or, right here. Or right doing by the my gratitude desk. exercise. You know, the gratitude exercise. Doing it, um, you know, on a regular basis, one once a day. Now imagine if schools, every school, started the day by with three deep breaths hmm. or every school you know in the middle of a lesson you know let's say you're sitting for 25 minutes okay let's get up and just you know move our hands you know up and down or whatever yeah that will help you know the, the blood flow you know the, the the brain work again you know the 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 um, the, the, the the tiredness to dissipate a, a little bit or to commit to an extra act of kindness Sonia Lubomirsky talks about this she does yeah. um you know twice a week Beyond what you normally do. Oh, absolutely. What Even I think is, once a week, if it's something, you know, more yeah. intentional, transformative stuff, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's good. Uh, can we talk before I let you go? I know we're running out of time here a little bit, uh, but uh, can we talk about the Happiness Studies Academy that you are now investing a lot of your efforts into? Yeah. So you know, th this is a product um, of um, of. Uh, question that came to mind six, seven years ago, um, which was, um, how is it that there is a field of study for psychology, what I've been doing, uh, history, medicine, bi uh, biology, uh, literature, geography, you name it, but there's of no course. field of study for happiness. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there is a positive psychology, but that's just the psychology of happiness. What about what philosophers like Lao Tzu or Aristotle had to say about happiness. What about what uh, literature, you know, whether it's Marianne Evans or Shakespeare had to say about happiness or Chinua Kebe. What about what um, neuroscience has to say about happiness or economics? Why isn't there a field or rather an interdisciplinary field of study dedicated to happiness? And with, um, with, with, with a few people I co-created um, the, uh, the Happiness Studies Academy, where we launched, first of all, a certificate program in Happiness Studies, and, uh, which is year long. And just um, three months ago, four months ago, launched the world's first master's degree in wow. Happiness Studies with uh, Centenary University, which is online. We have students from over uh, 80 countries Wonderful. in our programs. And it's... Uh, it's such such a treat where we talk about happiness through the lens of positive psychology and through the lens of the greatest thinkers and the, the greatest works of art and 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 through of course neuroscience and it's all you know theoretical and more than anything applied applied how can yeah. i help myself and others increase levels of well-being whether i'm a manager or a parent or a coach or a therapist or fill in the blank Yes, yes, that's wonderful. What a what an amazing effort. I mean, that's essentially echoes and answers the question that I had earlier. How is it that something so powerful that can redirect your life and increase everything—health, success, wealth, longevity, relationships, marriages, 
uh, is not studied, <laughs> it's not invested in on average by by more people, right? So, and that you're solving that problem right now with the uh, Happiness Studies Academy. That's just wonderful. Oh, thank you. That's wonderful. Well, Tal, it's been a treat. You're a treasure trove of insights. I uh, I just love everything you said, and uh, may your work uh, bless as many people as possible. And um, perhaps maybe you can come back at some point and and give us some more insights, some more discoveries, uh, give us an, even an update on the on the Happiness Studies Academy and and what the the and the people that that leave this academy, the kind of impact they may be having in the world. So thank you again. Right. Thank you very much, Christian.